Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jim, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And yes, deep down, I am still a herpetologist. And thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. This is uh, such a beautiful spring day. When I woke up this morning and looked around, I thought, oh my god, it's going to be my family members and my five or ten closest friends coming to this presentation, and that's it. So I really am uh, grateful for, to all of you for showing up uh, for this presentation. Now, this is a university, and I kind of like to start my presentations in a university setting with a little bit of a quiz. So I'd like to see if anybody in the audience can identify this sound. Anyone? My kids, you can't say anything, kids. It's interesting, people say whale very often. No, no takers? Say it again. No, no, anyone else? You know, Indri. Ah, Richard, primatologists, primatologists don't count. <laughs> yes, it is, uh, it is an Indri. It's the sound of one of my favorite animals on the planet, the Indri, which is the largest of the lemurs of Madagascar, one of the most spectacular creatures uh, on the planet. And it's interesting, when I play this, people often say whale. If you take this sound and you slow it down, it sounds exactly like the sound of the humpback whale. So it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting creature. It does not survive in captivity. If you want to see it, you can only see it in Madagascar. And it really is a symbol of a country that is symbolic of the conservation issues that we, uh, we face on this planet and I'm going to talk a lot about uh, during the course of this, uh, this presentation. Now, it's also great to be back here. Oh, I can see this is going to be a good audience. If you like my Emperor Tamarin, this is the Emperor Tamarin from the Amazon region of South America, appropriately named after Emperor Franz Josef of Austria. And, <laughs> and I was here from 1971 to 1978 uh, doing my graduate degree with uh, Professor Irvin DeVore uh, in the Peabody Museum, working on non-human primates, especially uh, those from Amazonia, like the uh, Wakari monkeys and other members of that group and then finally doing my thesis in the country of Suriname on the eight primate species that occur there. And later working on the Atlantic forest region of Brazil, which is one of the uh, other very high priority biodiversity hotspots. But I actually had my office in the Museum of Comparative Zoology with uh, Ernest Williams, the herpetologist, the uh, curator of herpetology at that time, and did a lot of work on turtles, especially some of the river turtles of, uh, of South America. And this is actually what I started out doing as a, as a young boy and continued to be very interested in and working very closely with another gentleman here in the audience, Anders Rodin, Dr. Anders Rodin, who is the chair of the IUCN's Species Survival Commission Freshwater Turtle and Tortoise Specialist Group and one of the leaders of conservation on these critically important uh, animals. And it's a Tremendous honor to receive this medal. I had the great privilege of knowing Roger Torrey Peterson when I was at World Wildlife Fund in the 1980s. He was a member of the board of director, and he has been an inspiration to me, and I'm going to say a little bit more towards the end of this presentation about some of the things that he, in fact, did inspire in me. And when I look at the list of recipients of uh, this medal, I am truly honored. Ed Wilson, who really is the, the Darwin of the 20th and the 21st century, wonderful uh, scientist who will go down in the annals of, uh, of uh, history as one of the great figures in, in biology and in science overall. Uh, Jared Diamond, who's a good friend and a member of our board of directors. Jane Goodall, of course, the world's leading primatologist and probably the most recognized scientist in the world. So I'm very, very honored to receive this, uh, this medal today. Can we turn the lights down a little bit more? Now, I have a lot that I want to cram into this presentation. I don't often get the chance to speak here at Harvard, so I'm going to really give you a lot of information on a lot of different things. Not everything that Conservation International is involved in, but a good cross-section of what we're trying to do globally. And I'm going to focus on several different topics. First of all, the importance of setting priorities, hotspots, high biodiversity wilderness areas, megadiversity countries, some of the priority setting mechanisms that we've used, how hotspots has served us as a fundraising tool and a marketing tool over the past 20 years, 
I'm going to say a little bit about where we're going, looking at the future, the role of uh, governments, <clears throat> the private sector, and the great importance of indigenous communities. I'm going to say a lot about uh, the climate issue, particularly the forest component of uh, climate change. <clears throat> and lastly, focus back at our roots, uh, which are the, the species conservation, the continuing great importance of conserving the great diversity of species that exist on this planet. Now, to start out with the basics, you know all what biodiversity is, but I always like to rehash this a bit. I define biodiversity as that wealth of genes, species, ecosystems, and ecological processes that makes our living planet what it is. It's the sum total of all life on Earth. <clears throat> and it's our living legacy to future generations. We all know that, but very often we overlook the fact that it is also the basic underpinning of sustainable development, and I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. Another key point about biodiversity is that we still are remarkably ignorant about the, life, the other life forms that share the planet with us. We have described by science somewhere on the order of 1.7 to 1.8 million species of everything, plants, animals, microorganisms, and yet estimates of total diversity run from 5 million to 10 million to 30 million or more, and the most recent data that's, uh, that's been coming in of late indicate that the probable figure is on the order of, uh, of uh, 10 million, but we really don't yet know. That means that we are an order of magnitude off in terms of our understanding of the diversity of life forms that, that are out there, which is really pretty remarkable when you think about it. Here we are in the 21st century with incredibly sophisticated technology. We sent a spaceship to uh, the different parts of the solar system starting 40 years ago, and yet we still don't know to within an order of magnitude how many other life forms are on this planet. And it really needs to be focused on, I think, in the very near future. Just some Personal examples of this, uh, it's not that surprising that we don't know all the canopy beetles of the Amazon rainforest or some of the creatures of the deep sea ocean trenches, but our ignorance extends even to our closest living relatives, the non-human primates. This is a little species of marmoset monkey that I described from the central Brazilian Amazon back in 1992. This is another one, a distinct genus of uh, marmoset called the dwarf marmoset that we described in 1996. These were just two of more than 50 primate species, new species of primates that have been described in the very recent past. More than 50 just since the turn of the millennium, which is really, uh, really, really quite remarkable. And I'd like to take my hat off to the Encyclopedia of Life, in which uh, Harvard has a, a great role, really, I think, one of the most innovative and amazing projects in the history of, of science. And I'd also like to highlight the critical role of museums in all of this. Without museums, it's going to be very difficult for us to really get a handle on what is out there. And the MCZ is one of the greatest institutions of this kind in the world. And I was really delighted to be able to spend seven years working out of that museum. Okay, why are we concerned about biodiversity? Well, the obvious reasons, intrinsic value, the moral imperative, the aesthetic value of biodiversity, the great cultural values, and of course the scientific value. There's enormous economic value of biodiversity as well, biotechnology, this emerging science of uh, biomimicry, uh, the importance of wild crop relatives for maintaining our agricultural productivity, uh, the recreational value, the growing value of ecotourism around the world, and a very, very important uh, component, ecosystem services, the services of nature that are derived from biodiversity that we ourselves depend on for our own survival. The importance of forests in, in maintaining clean water supplies, pollination, which we take for granted but is critically important, disaster prevention, and this very, very important uh, issue of the role of forests, especially tropical forests, in mitigating climate change. And I'll be saying more about that at the end of the presentation. And in terms of research agendas, one of the real focal areas that we need to concentrate on over the next few years is demonstrating why biodiversity is critical to maintaining ecosystem services, how more diverse systems provide more and better services of this kind, and then showing how these ecosystem services, which are so taken for granted, how they really are the fundamental underpinning of sustainable development, poverty alleviation, and ultimate achievement of uh, human well-being. And if there are students in the audience that want to pick a uh, thesis topic, this is something that you would do well to focus on. We're also concerned that uh, loss of uh, biodiversity is irreversible. Once a species of plant or animal goes extinct, it's gone forever and will never be seen again. And in fact, there are many, many threats out there now to 
the, life, the other life forms of the planet. You're familiar with these, but it's good always to run through them. Uh, destruction of tropical forests and other natural habitats is uh, the number one cause, whether it's for slash and burn agriculture, as in this western dry forest of Madagascar, or enormous clearance of land for uh, monoculture uh, plantations, such as uh, oil palm in uh, Borneo and other parts of Southeast Asia, or this growing push for um, biofuels. This is sugarcane in the, the western part of Madagascar as well. Uh, logging, unsustainable tropical forest logging. I, ha I happen to think that logging of tropical forests is a 19th century activity that has no place in the modern world. These forests are worth much, much more for the other services that they provide and the biodiversity that they conserve, and they should really be conserved to the maximum extent possible. You have destruction of natural habitats for firewood and charcoal production. You have flooding of vast areas for hydroelectric projects like this dam in, uh, in Venezuela. Mining, another very important issue. This is um, diamond mining in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is uh, gold mining at the edge of the Pantanal region of Brazil. And then you have this insidious threat of bushmeat hunting, uh, especially in West and Central Africa. This is a bushmeat market in, uh, in Liberia. And this impacts even our closest living relatives, the, uh, the great apes. And this is not a subsistence trade for the most part. This very often is a luxury trade where people are paying, in large cities, are paying a premium for chimp or gorilla or other kinds of bushmeat, paying more for it than chicken or beef or fish. In Southeast Asia, there's an enormous trade in, uh, in uh, turtles and other forms of wildlife, uh, especially going into Chinese markets. And this is an issue that has been focused on a lot by the experts on, uh, on turtles. This is a, a book that uh, Dr. Rodin was a, was a lead on, on the Asian turtle trade, that really highlighted what is happening, how we're just literally sucking tons and tons, thousands of tons of these animals out of, um, out of the rivers of uh, Southeast Asia to feed a, uh, a large market in, uh, in China and in other parts of the region. But it's not restricted to Asia. This is the radiated tortoise of Madagascar, one of the most beautiful tortoises in the world and a real focus for, um, for ecotourists. It still, in some parts of the country, is traded in. Sometimes it's killed just to get a hold of its liver to make pate of tortoise, which is really a disgraceful waste of these wonderful animals. Also in uh, parts of Asia, you have use of uh, different kinds of wildlife for medicinal purposes. This is monkey wine. These are two uh, endangered duke langers that were killed as, uh, for medicinal purposes. And some of the values that are placed on these creatures for their uh, medicinal, uh, supposed medicinal properties. This is a, a little uh, Chinese uh, a box turtle, uh, Cuora trifasciata that is about this big, and a wild specimen will bring four to $5,000 just because of its supposed uh, medicinal uses. The pet trade is also an issue. Uh, one very good example, again coming from Madagascar, is this uh, wonderful Anganuk tortoise. It's this huge tortoise that comes from the northwestern part of Madagascar. It's down to about 200 individuals in the wild, and yet it's starting to appear on websites for the pet trade in China, and the prices for it go from 10 to $20,000 per animal. So you can imagine the enormous pressure to pull these animals, these remaining individuals, out of, the, out of the wild. Invasive species, also a big issue. This is a cute bunny, but it happens to be an invasive species in the uh, temperate rainforest of, um, of um, Argentina. And this is an invasive plant. Invasive plants tend to be overlooked, and yet they have an enormous impact, especially on island systems. This is an invasive vine that's de destroying a gallery forest in, uh, in southern Madagascar. And sometimes species are killed just for reasons that we don't really fully understand. I'm sure you all heard about the death of the uh, seven mountain gorillas in, uh, in Congo back about uh, two years ago. And we really still don't know who was responsible for this killing. But this area, this eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Virunga volcanoes, it's a real hotbed of uh, political unrest. And unfortunately, sometimes these wonderful animals are victims of this, uh, this unrest. And of course, we have climate change, which poses a, a major threat to, um, to biodiversity. And yet, as I'll say later on in this presentation, I think this huge focus we have on climate change right now, and on especially on the forest component of it, presents us with a unique historic opportunity as well, and something that we really need to take advantage of literally over the next few months and over the next couple of three years. 
So we're facing an impending extinction crisis. We're losing species. We're losing forests and other habitats. And we're seeing the erosion of critical ecosystem services. Some of the, we're doing many things to combat this. One of the most important is to work with the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is really the umbrella body for conservation in the world. It's kind of a UN for conservation, but also has non-governmental members and has been around since, uh, since 19, uh, 1949. And we work very closely with the IUCN on what are, what are called global assessments, red list assessments, to determine the status of endangered species and in so doing to figure out what it is we need to do to conserve them. Uh, we completed in 2004 a red list assessment of amphibians that showed that about one in every five of the world's amphibians, frogs, salamanders, Sicilians, were at risk of going extinct, either in the critically endangered or the endangered category. And a lot of this is due to a very strange disease, the chytrid fungus that is killing these animals all over the tropical world and in temperate regions as well. This is a very recent example of this. This is the mountain chicken. It's a large frog from the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. And these pictures come literally from the past couple of days. The chytrid fungus has hit Montserrat. And all of a sudden, these animals, which are a popular food so source and were not that, uh, not that uncommon, are just dying in their tracks. And this has happened in many different places. And there's a huge research effort going on, a conservation effort to try to combat this. But this is an example of a very, very difficult issue that we're, we're facing. And in many ways, these frogs are ca the canary in the coal mine showing us that there's something wrong with the planet and that we really need to pay much closer attention. We also uh, just completed a global mammal assessment, uh, which was launched at the uh, last uh, World Congress of the uh, IUCN in Barcelona back in October. And this assessed the status of all of the world's mammals. And just to give you an example of what came out of this, about uh, one in every three of the world's primates are either in the critically endangered or endangered category, some of them down to a few dozen or a few hundred individuals and in urgent need of conservation attention. So our organization has worked on this issue now. The organization is 22 years old. And I'm not implying that our organization has all the answers. We're one of a number of international uh, conservation organizations. What I'm going to talk about today is principally our work, because I think it's indicative of the kind of activities that some of the major conservation organizations are involved in. And our traditional mission was to conserve Earth's living heritage, our global biodiversity, and to demonstrate that human societies can live harmoniously with nature. But over the past year, we've go gone through a uh, strategic planning exercise in which we're modifying our mission statement to some extent. We don't even have a final new mission statement yet. But what is going to come out of this exercise is that we're going to modify our mission a bit to demonstrate that biodiversity conservation is essential to the maintenance of critical ecosystem services and that these ecosystem services are the underpinning of sustainable development and human well-being. So we're going to take more of a focus on the human well-being angle so that we really are able to make biodiversity conservation not just a marginal issue, but a central issue to other global, major global concerns. Now, in terms of our, our uh, basic premises, the work that we've been carrying out over the past few years, we recognize that all biodiversity is important and all nations should do everything possible to conserve their living resources. But biodiversity is by no means evenly distributed over the face of the planet, and rather it's heavily concentrated in a relatively small total area, and a large portion of that area has been heavily impacted by human activities. So our approach has always been to be strategic and to set priorities based on the best available science. We've used a number of different priority setting mechanisms, mostly hotspots, high biodiversity wilderness areas, and this concept of megadiversity countries, which has kind of been a background uh, concept. I'll just mention that very briefly. It's a concept that I first came up with in 1988 and uh, elaborated on in this book that we did in uh, 1997. And it recognizes that of all the 200 or so countries in the world, there are 18 that have a critically important role in ensuring the survival of the full range of life on Earth and that these countries, these 18 countries, have within them more than two-thirds of all known species, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. Here's the list of those countries. I'm not going to go through them now, but uh, just note that Brazil and Indonesia are by far and away the two top countries. The US is also uh, on that list. 
And there are a number of other surprises on there. For instance, the country of France is the only European country on there, but it's not there because of the importance of France in Europe, but because they have many overseas territories and departments in the tropics that provide a big piece of their biodiversity. And this has had a lot of influence in a number of different sectors. It even led to the independent creation of what's called a like-minded group of megadiverse countries in the Convention on Biodiversity, which is the principal treaty dealing with this, uh, with this issue. You'll note that I'm drinking Starbucks because Starbucks is a big supporter of conservation as well. <laughs> also because I like it. But the main, the main priority setting mechanism for us has been uh, biodiversity hotspots. And hotspots are all about prioritizing areas of high irreplaceability as measured by endemic species and a high level of threat. This is a concept that Norman Myers, uh, the British ecologist, first came up with in 1988. And when I saw it, I thought, God, this is a great idea. Let's, uh, let's adopt it. So when I went to Conservation International in 1989, I took this concept with me. Very conveniently, the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago adopted it at the same time. And they were, during the 90s, the single largest supporter, largest private supporter of biodiversity conservation activities in the world. And we revised the concept a number of times, first in the end of the 1990s and then again in the early part of this decade. In the first reanalysis that we did, we came up with uh, 25 hotspots. And in the latest analysis, we went up to 34. And I have in parentheses 35 because the eastern rainforests of Australia were in the process of putting those in as a biodiversity hotspot as well. Here's where they're located, the original st extent of these hotspots. Heavily tropical forests, but not exclusively tropical forest systems. All of the five uh, Mediterranean-type systems in the world are also on the hotspot list, including Southern California, the Mediterranean itself, the Cape region of, uh, of South Africa. So it's not just tropical forests. The original extent of these hotspots was about 16% of the land surface of the planet. This is an area roughly equivalent to Russia and Australia put together. Almost 90% of that has already been lost. And what remains is an area of about 2.3% of Earth's land surface, a little over 3 million square kilometers. This is roughly equivalent to the size of the country of India or the five largest American states put together. Not a very large area in global terms. And yet, within this very small area, you have compressed 50%, at least 50% of all of the world's plants as endemic species found nowhere else, and more than 40% of all of your vertebrates, again, as endemics found nowhere else. If you want to look at the uh, most endangered species out there, really the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, extinction risk, using the IUCN's red list of threatened species, you see that anywhere from 70 to more than 90 percent of the most endangered species, those in the critically endangered and endangered categories, are concentrated in these biodiversity hotspots. Now, a few key points about hotspots. As I said earlier, it's not just tropical rainforest. It's also not just species richness or endemism. It's also concentration of endemism at higher taxonomic levels, endemic genera, endemic families. And this reflects the extent to which these areas also help to conserve deep lineages and evolutionary history. And I'll say a bit more about that in relation to Madagascar in a, in a few minutes. Now, Madagascar is perhaps the classic example of a biodiversity hotspot in every sense of the word. It's an island about a little smaller than Texas, a little larger than California. It's located about 400 kilometers off the east coast of Africa. It was separated from the African mainland about 160 million years ago and broke off from India, to which it was also connected about 80 to 90 million years ago. And evolution has proceeded there largely in isolation since that time. You have a great diversity of habitat types there, from rainforest to these wonderful giant baobab dry forests of southwestern Madagascar to the southern spiny desert to unique transitional formations like this area in the south that's a transition between the dry forest and the rainforest, tiny areas and yet rich in endemic species as well. Plant diversity here is off the charts, 14 to 15,000 species, 80 percent or more endemic. This is almost as many plant species as you have in all of North America, north of Mexico, which is an area about 32 times larger. Reptiles, enormous diversity, more than 400 species, again, more than in all of North America and north of Mexico, including uh, the chameleons, the largest radiation of chameleons on the planet, 
and some pretty bizarre snakes and other reptile species. And amphibians, amphibians have gone crazy there. We know of about 230 species, but we're finding new ones just about every month, and the experts on amphibians think the total could wind up being four, five, six hundred. times more than you get in all of North America and north of Mexico. And no chytrid fungus yet. Not yet. But the animals that are really the most famous in Madagascar and what attracted uh, me there in the first place are the lemurs, the radiation of non-human primates found only on Madagascar and nowhere else in the world, and including some very unusual little creatures. This is Madame Bert's mouse lemur, which is only about 30 grams, even smaller than uh, my little friend. This is the smallest of all living primates up to the Indri, which is the largest of living species and grows to be about a meter tall and weighs about 20 pounds, looks like a cross between a teddy bear and a giant panda and jumps from tree to tree like, a, like an arboreal kangaroo. And the eye, eye, the mysterious eye, eye, which is the most aberrant, the most unusual of all of the primates. And if you think the adults are strange looking, take a look at this baby. <laughs> that one was born in the Duke University Primate Center. And they named him E.T. <laughs> in all, there are five families and 15 genera of lemurs in Madagascar. They're 100% endemic. And this is indicative of this very, very high level of endemism that you get in this country. If you look at endemism at the family level for plants and vertebrates, you find that among the hotspots, Madagascar has 25 families that are found only there and nowhere else. This is an enormous concentration of higher level endemism. If you look at genera, again, Madagascar is at the top of the list, 478 genera of plants and vertebrates found only there and nowhere else in the world. This is meaning, means that so much of global diversity, important global diversity, is concentrated in this one island. Unfortunately, Madagascar is also a world champion in forest uh, destruction. Our own species arrived there only about uh, about 2,000 years ago, but has had a large impact since then. This is the central plateau region of Madagascar. Much of it looks like this. It's the worst erosion you'll see anywhere on the planet. Every year, the rivers run red with eroded soil. And in one part of the country, up in the northwest, the Betsebuk River, which you see here, runs out into the ocean, a red plume of eroded soil that is so distinctive that the astronauts first noticed it from outer space and actually photographed it. More than 90% of Madagascar's original natural vegetation is lost, and what remains is about 50 to 60,000 square kilometers, which is an area that's about two and a half to three New Jerseys. I don't know how many Massachusetts that would be, probably about four or five. But really, a tiny area globally in which you have all of these amazing life forms concentrated, many of them at risk of going extinct. Hunting is a problem as well. In some parts of the country, you still have hunting of lemurs and other species for food. And Madagascar is, along with Australia and New Zealand, the Hawaiian Islands, a few other places, one of the most extreme examples of recent extinctions. Here you see the Indri uh, in the silhouette in scale, along with some of the recently extinct giant lemurs, which included animals like Archaeoindris, which got, which got to be larger than an adult gorilla. You had uh, uh, sp two species, Paleopropithecus and Babacutia, which were basically sloth lemurs. They had a niche similar to the sloths of uh, South America, but they weighed up to 80 to 100 pounds. And my favorite is Megalatopus, which was a koala-like lemur. Got to be about this big, also weighed about 100 pounds, and unfortunately is no longer with us. We've started now to do reconstructions of these animals to get the uh, Malagasy excited about what they had in the past. This is a life-size, biologically accurate reconstruction of Megalatopus that we, we uh, sent over there and we're about to give to the president of the country, but unfortunately he's not in office anymore. I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. You also had the elephant birds, which were the largest birds that, uh, that ever lived. Uh, this is what the elephant bird eggs looked like, and this is what remains of them. Enormous creatures that disappeared probably four to 500 years ago. So all of this... Uh, brings us to the conclusion many of us believe that Madagascar is the single highest priority hotspot on the planet and we really have major challenges ahead of us to make sure that the incredible things that are there are not lost. But what's happening there is also happening in most of your other hotspots as well. So it's really an indicator of the priority and the urgency and the opportunities 
the challenges that we have in ensuring the survival of these areas. What's amazing is that in spite of all that's been lost, we're still finding new species there hand over fist. This is a new species of lemur that was found uh, by some of our German colleagues back about six or seven years ago, Mirza Zaza. And just to give you an indication of the growth of uh, number of in the number of lemur species just in the past 15 years, in 1994 we did the first field guide to the lemurs. There were 50 different kinds. We redid it in 2006. There were 71. And we're redoing it again now, and there are over 100 new species. So that's a doubling of a primate fauna just in 15 years. This is uh, the one in the middle is one of my favorites, <laughs> Mittermeier's mouse lemur. And there is one, another species that was named after me that does have more gray hair. <laughs> and this brings up the point of naming opportunities. We, uh, we have so many new species out there now, we can either name them after every family member and every friend that we've ever had, or we can look at creative ways of coming up with names and using some of these new species as uh, ways of raising funds. This is a bit controversial, but it's something that I think is worth exploring because we have so many, with thousands and thousands and thousands of new species that are going to be described over the next few decades. This is an example of a beautiful little frog from Colombia that I named after one of my favorite donors who has contributed several million dollars to species conservation over the past few years. And this magnificent creature, another species from Colombia, the previous one was from Colombia, that hasn't been named yet. So, <laughs> if anyone's interested. <laughs> now, hot, <laughs> if they're large enough. Now, we've always had a dual focus, uh, megadiversity being something of a, of a sideshow for us. We always had this dual focus on both hotspots and what we call high biodiversity wilderness areas. These were elaborated on in a book that we did in 2003 called Wilderness. And what they are basically is areas that also have very high levels of biodiversity, also high levels of endemism, but in contrast to the hotspots, they're still largely intact. There are only a few of these around. They occupy a total of about 6% of the land surface of the planet. This is about three times what you have in the hotspots. And there are only about five of those, the most obvious being the uh, Amazon region of South America, the Congo forest, and the island of New Guinea. And I'll focus in on uh, one part of Amazonia, which I think is particularly important, and which uh, Jim also uh, mentioned already in his uh, introduction, and that is the Guiana Shield region of northeastern South America, the northeastern part of the Amazon region, which is the world's largest and most pristine tropical rainforest region. We began our efforts to really conserve this area in Suriname back in uh, the late 1990s in uh, trying to create a large protected area in the central part of the country. You see that area, if I can figure out how to work this, right here. It's called the Central Suriname Nature Reserve. It's an area about the size of the state of New Jersey, completely pristine forest. And that got us going on trying to develop more protected areas in this region as a whole, because so much of it is still completely intact. 2002, the Brazilians added a major area on the French Guiana, Brazil, Suriname border. That continued with the number of state protected areas in some of the um, Amazonian states. More in 2006, and as we look at uh, this past year and our projections for some areas in the future, we have this enormous block in green of state and federal protected areas and in pink indigenous lands, which are areas that are occupied by small populations of indigenous people and are comparably intact to the areas that are set aside as parks or reserves. This is an enormous block probably on the order of, we haven't done the calculation recently, but somewhere between two and three times the size of the state of California, with maybe 100,000 people living in it, and most of those are, almost all of those are indigenous people. The island of New Guinea is another spectacular area that uh, is still reasonably intact, although it's suffered a bit from uh, logging and mining activities in recent years. And this area is unusual in terms of its, not just its biodiversity, but its human cultural diversity. It's kind of the epicenter of human cultural diversity on the planet. The island has about thousand, a thousand languages and distinct cultures, and this is about one-sixth of all the languages that are still spoken on the planet. 
We've done a number of projects there as well. The most recent is a very interesting one in the northeastern part of the country on the Yuan Peninsula, which is being done with the Woodland Park Zoo in, uh, in Seattle, the Use Conservation Area, and it's focused on tree kangaroos. Tree kangaroos and, at the same time, protection of critical ecosystem services for local villagers and looking at how we can benefit from the carbon value of the forests as we move into this uh, climate change issue. And I should also point out that we have one of the world's experts on, uh, on the island of New Guinea with us here, Tim Lehman, who has uh, been working on the uh, birds of paradise. He started out as a primatologist, and uh, now he's kind of fo focused heavily on the birds of paradise. And he has the most unbelievable images of these creatures, which have to be the most beautiful birds on, uh, on the planet. The bottom line is that the hotspots in the high biodiversity wilderness areas are the top priority in terrestrial biodiversity conservation. They're also very important for fresh water. And if we fail in these areas, and especially in the hotspots, we lose a major portion of the world's biodiversity, regardless of how successful we are everywhere else. We could have great successes everywhere else in the world. If we lose these areas, we're going to lose at least half the plants and more than 40 percent of the vertebrates that are found only there and nowhere else. Now, interestingly, these areas are important not just for biodiversity, but for other reasons as well. As it turns out, they also happen to be the places where many of our most important uh, commodities are grown. You can see the overlap here with uh, coffee-growing regions and hotspots. And as I started to mention with the island of New Guinea, they are real focal areas for human cultural diversity as well. We're in the process of finishing a, an analysis of the distribution of human languages, a total of about 6,900 languages that are still spoken. Half of those are in the biodiversity hotspots, the original extent of these areas, and about 1,600 of those are in the high biodiversity wilderness areas. You add those up and you're looking at 74 percent of all languages and the associated cultures being concentrated in these areas, and including also some of the most endangered human cultures groups with a few hundred or a few thousand individuals remaining. So there's a very strong overlap between priorities for uh, maintaining human cultural diversity and biodiversity. We also, also just published in uh, the Conservation Biology Journal a paper looking at uh, hotspots and centers of violent conflict. And we looked at areas that since 1950 had undergone uh, conflicts in which more than 1,000 people lost their lives. 80% of those were in the hotspot areas. Now, I'm not going to go into cause and effect because, obviously, the cause of such uh, unrest is very, uh, very complex and not easy to understand. But there is something going on here that we need to analyze in more detail. And we're in the process of uh, carrying out some research to get a better handle on why so much of this um, activity takes place in these areas that are also priorities for conservation. Now, if you look at the total land area of the hotspots and the high biodiversity wilderness areas together, it's about 8 percent of the land surface of the planet. It's a small percentage, but it's still a very large area. So where do we focus within these hotspots and high biodiversity wilderness areas? What are the priority sites? How do we get a handle? on those areas that need protection, either those that are as yet unprotected or those that need better protection in the years to come. And to get a handle on this, we've come up with this concept of key biodiversity areas, which really looks at uh, using a, a variety of criteria, identification of the key sites. This builds on the experience of the bird people, uh, starting off with important bird areas, IBAs. And we've elaborated on this uh, quite a bit now. We've uh, done these analyses in about a dozen different hotspots. This is what it looks like for the Philippines, uh, we're in the process of doing this for many other regions as well. And we work with a group called the Alliance for Zero Extinctions. This is a group that we helped to uh, create uh, several years ago. And this group looks at the tip of the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, extinction risks. It looks at those single sites that are critical for the survival of species that are about to go extinct species that only occur in a single site, and if you lose that site, they're gone. That's the terrestrial side. We also have uh, a program, a growing program, on freshwater systems in recognition of the fact that if you look at freshwater systems in a global context, they're probably the single most endangered uh, hotspot 
if you want to use that term for them, in the world, and they're critically important for our own survival. And we also have a huge marine program, about which I'm going to say nothing today, because if I got into our marine program, it would take me another hour, and I think I would lose most of you. Suffice it to say that we have a huge effort underway in marine systems. It's uh, an effort that's uh, been spending over the past few years on the order of 40 to uh, 50 million dollars looking at uh, marine management area science, looking at some of the uh, assessing some of the endangered uh, marine species through a global marine species assessment process with the uh, IUCN, and particularly focusing on a series of seascapes, which are the um, the ocean-based equivalent of landscapes or corridors in the terrestrial realm. And we've had good success in some of the highest priority areas of the world for marine conservation. And if you're interested in that, Les Kaufman is here with us, and he is one of our key partners in, in developing our marine conservation activities, uh, and has been now for several years. Now, a little bit about how we find the resources to do all of this work, and how hotspots have been a very effective fundraising and marketing tool, and how it's made it possible for us to find the the dollars needed to do conservation. Uh, one example of uh, a hotspots-based uh, fundraising success is what's called the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. This was uh, a mechanism that actually grew out of the launch of the uh, first hotspots book that we did back in the year uh, 2000. We launched that at the World Bank. And that stimulated the interest of the then president of the World Bank, Jim Wolfenson, to the point that we were able to create a fund with a lead from, the, uh, from CI and from the World Bank of $125 million over five years focused on working in the hotspots and working with civil society organizations, not governments, civil society organizations. And we brought in as partners the Global Environment Facility, again, the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago, and interestingly, the government of Japan, which became a major partner. We finished the first uh, five-year cycle, supported many different projects, and we've now entered into a second cycle. And in addition to the original partners, we've added the government of France as a full partner in this. And we're looking at several other European governments, notably Germany and Monaco, as potential partners in this effort as well. This has been enormously effective and has resulted in support for well over a thousand different conservation efforts in 16 or 17 of these hotspots. With support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, we also created something called the Global Conservation Fund. This is $100 million over five years focused on creating new parks and reserves, again in the hotspots and the high biodiversity wilderness areas, and also on developing trust fund mechanisms. So you didn't just pump all the money in at once, but you created mechanisms that ensured that there would be long-term sustained funding for recurrent costs in these areas. With that, we were able to create uh, 40 new protected areas and cover an area of about 73 million hectares uh, in either ongoing or completed deals. And this is an area about almost twice the size of the state of California. So as we look to the future, many challenges out there for sure, but I think there's great cause for optimism as well, and I'm glad that as mentioned in the beginning of uh, the, in the introduction that I'm an optimist. I'm very much of an optimist, and I don't think I will be in this business if I wasn't. Sometimes the, it gets frustrating and we have a lot of setbacks, but you've got to continue to believe that you can do it and to be optimistic about the possibilities for the future. And in fact, we're seeing changing attitudes and new visions. We're seeing exciting new leadership. We're seeing particularly exciting new leadership in this country, which I think is really going to uh, turn the tide and, and reestablish the United States as a global leader on these issues. And we see a real opportunity to change the scale of our efforts. Now, I'll just give a very brief example, one each from these um, uh, different uh, components, governments, the private sector, and this critically important piece, working with indigenous communities. At a global level, working with governments, we see some interesting new policy initiatives on biodiversity, two of them in particular. One is called TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which is looking at biodiversity-based ecosystem service markets uh, and using the language of the financial world. It's actually being developed by a gentleman named Pavan Sukhdev. He spoke here, I think, a, a few weeks ago. And he works for the, he's being seconded to this uh, from the Deutsche Bank. And another one that's just in the process of being developed, mainly coming out of Europe, is called IPES, the International Platform of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The intent is to have this be something like 
uh, some a biodiversity equivalent of the IPCC for climate, but it's still in, in very early stages. But the fact that the world is starting to look at these issues in a serious way, I think, is very positive. We also have some interesting new commitments by national governments. Again, I'll give you the example of Madagascar. This is, um, until about two or three weeks ago, was the president of uh, Madagascar, Mark Ravalomanana, who came in in 2002 as a breath of fresh air and made major commitments to conservation very quickly. At the World Parks Congress in 2003, he made the commitment to triple protected area coverage in his country over the next five years, recognizing the great importance that uh, Madagascar has. We had worked with the previous government to try to get them to do this. They did nothing. When he came in, we talked to him, and he immediately bought into this and made this commitment. He also asked us to help him cover the cost of doing this and to come up with a $50 million trust fund. We put in the first million dollars, and as of March of last year, just about a year ago, we passed the $50 million mark on this trust fund. We've also brought uh, high-level people from different parts of the world. This is a congressional delegation that I took, uh, took there a few years ago to meet with him and to encourage him to do even more. On the, the gentleman on the left there is John Tanner from Tennessee, and on the right, uh, Tom Udall, who was then a congressman but is now a senator from New Mexico, one of the most uh, committed people to the conservation issue in the entire U.S. Senate. We brought big donors. This is Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel and uh, the most generous private supporter of biodiversity conservation ever. And media groups. This is Jeff Corwin doing a program there with us uh, for Anderson Cooper 360, which came out about a year ago. So we've tried everything possible to reinforce the president's interest. We also had a little bit of help from Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> they did two films now called Madagascar. Unfortunately, the uh, biological content is a little weak. <laughs> They've got penguins and lions and giraffes and hippos and zebras and things like that that don't really occur in Madagascar except when DreamWorks sends them there. But nonetheless, this was a great boost in name recognition. You can criticize it for many different reasons, but it put the name Madagascar on uh, the map, certainly in this country and in other parts of the world. And I took the uh, CEO of DreamWorks there shortly before the film came out, Jeffrey Katzenberg. He gave $500,000 for uh, ecotourism development in Madagascar. He was ready to give more as part of the, uh, the new film, the Madagascar 2, that came out recently. Uh, and then we hit a little political roadblock about which I'll say something shortly. And the president uh, was true to his commitment. He created a whole bunch of new protected areas, uh, 1.75 million hectares, which is not a huge area in, uh, in Amazonian terms, but it doubled the size of the protected area network in Madagascar. And unfortunately, as most of you probably know, as of January of this year, we hit a major roadblock there. The president, uh, who had, although he was very good in his first term, did some foolish things in his uh, second term. And the mayor of the capital city decided he would be better as uh, president. So there were demonstrations. Mark Ravalomanana, as of a few weeks ago, was, at least for now, booted out. And this young fellow, 34-year-old former disc jockey, is now the president. But it appears that he's not quite sure what to do either. So they've just in the past week put together a 20-person committee to figure out where to go with Madagascar. So we're just sitting and waiting to see what happens. As soon as it's clear that there's someone in power again there, I'm going to be on the next plane over there talking to them to see, uh, to make sure that they keep to this commitment of uh, the previous president, and there's a chance that he'll come back again. So this is just indicative of the fact that there are no final victories in conservation. We were so happy that Madagascar was becoming a real success story, and bang, you hit a wall. And you just can't get frustrated. You just have to back off, regroup, and figure out what to do and try to move forward with it. If you pull out and give up, then you've lost all the investment and you've lost one of the most important areas on the planet. So again, you've got to keep that optimistic mindset and do whatever you need to do to keep the ball rolling. And sometimes you have to go into temporary holding pattern and wait and see what happens. But uh, I think you can, you can make things work just about anywhere. The private sector, another very interesting example. I'll touch on that just very briefly. But a lot of people have a hard time seeing the private sector being engaged in conservation. But if they don't engage, again, we're probably not going to be successful over the long term. So we've 
bitten the bullet and worked with some of the major corporations on our planet. And interestingly, uh, one of the most effective has been Walmart. Walmart has been criticized for many different things, but it really has adopted some very good environmental policies. And they're so huge and so influential that if they do something, all of the distributors, all of the people who buy from them or sell to them have to follow the same standards. So this is just one example of a way in which we can try to get the business community to adopt new and better practices in relation to the natural world. Indigenous people, major partners in many parts of the world. We have an initiative called the Indigenous and Traditional Peoples Initiative that focuses on working with these people who are usually at the bottom of the political and economic ladder in the countries in which they live and very much put to the side or overlooked, and yet they're very important in every sense of the word. Just to give you some examples, this is an old map of the Amazon region showing in dark green uh, protected areas and light green uh, indigenous reserves. About two-thirds of what's eventually going to be protected in the Amazon region is going to be in indigenous territories. And we focused on a number of different groups, perhaps the most exciting of which has been a group called the Kayapo. These are really amazing people who live in this southeastern region of the Brazilian Amazon. This is a picture that uh, my wife Christina took when we were there uh, a couple of years ago. We brought together a huge group of these people, the leaders of the different communities, to talk about what their issues are. There are about 6,000 of them. They live in an area of 11.5 million hectares. It's about 25, 26 million acres, an enormous area. It's an area about the size of the state of Virginia with only 6,000 people living in it. They live in these... Uh, beautiful little villages scattered over this um, pristine uh, tropical rainforest. And uh, of course, when you work with them, sometimes you have to adopt at least temporarily some of their practices. Fortunately, this is not permanent uh, tattoo. <laughs> and we succeeded with the leadership of this gentleman in particular. This man is uh, Megaron Chukaramai. He's the modern leader of the, uh, of the Kayapo. With his help, we've created a trust fund. We've provided support for them for over the past 15 years to protect their own territory. And we have a target of a $20 million trust fund for them, which will continue to give them the resources needed to uh, protect the lands from encroachment of various kinds. And we're so impressed with this man that we wound up putting him on our international board of directors alongside people like Harrison Ford in the lower left-hand corner, Gordon Moore from Intel in the uh, upper left, Rob Walton from Walmart, and a number of other very influential uh, business leaders. And he's really quite a, quite a character and one of the great leaders I've ever, uh, I've ever been in touch with. Now, climate change. You've heard a lot about climate change lately, and clearly it's a big threat, but I think that from the perspective of the conservation community, it's also a unique opportunity. Much of the attention on climate change in uh, the past few years has focused on energy, vehicle emissions, industry, and that's very appropriate. We've also paid a lot of attention to the pros and cons, mostly the cons of, uh, of biofuels. But until fairly recently, we had not paid very much attention to the forest component of the climate change issue. And now this is finally starting to take place in recognition of the fact that at least 20 percent of all emissions are coming from the burning of tropical forests. And I think this is an underestimate. I think it's actually going to come out to be substantially more than this when we start understanding more what's happening with emissions in tropical regions. And that puts uh, countries like Indonesia and Brazil in third and fourth place after the United States and China as the principal emitters of greenhouse gases. So it stands to reason that if burning of these tropical forests is emitting so much in the way of greenhouse gases, we should stop burning these forests. And this led to the concept of avoided deforestation, which over the past few years has morphed into RED, kind of a horrible acronym, but Reduction in Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation. This is a new concept. It's not part of the Kyoto Protocol. It will likely have to wait until 2012 for full acceptance, but happily we made major progress on recognizing the importance of this at the last major meeting of the Conference of Parties of the Climate Convention in Bali in December of 2007. And we now have the opportunity, eight months from now, in the next big meeting of the Climate Convention in Copenhagen, to move this forward in a major way and ensure that it's included in the, uh, the follow-up, in the successor to the Kyoto Protocol, which takes effect in 2012. Just again, some examples of things that we've done using Madagascar uh, once, one more time. 
uh, in this uh, northeastern region of Madagascar, we focused on some demonstration projects to show that forest carbon can actually be an economic benefit to these countries. And we've looked at two things. We've looked at both natural forest protection and reforestation. Natural forest being not part of the Kyoto Protocol, reforestation being recognized under the Kyoto Protocol. We got the World Bank to buy up uh, some tons of carbon from a natural forest area. And in terms of reforestation, the World Bank also participated in this. And we got Dell, computer company, to buy about 2.75 million of voluntary forest credits as well. Now, there are many projects like this underway in different parts of the world trying to show that uh, avoided deforestation, protection of natural forests, can in fact be an economic benefit to these countries. But a significant portion of the most important countries for tropical forests are not on the table in terms even of this mechanism. So I'm going into a fair amount of detail on this climate issue here with you because I think it's critically important. It's something that we all need to pay attention to and to the extent possible get our government to take a major leadership role in this over the next few months. And I'm referring here in particular to the high forest cover, low deforestation rate countries, countries like Suriname and Guyana, Colombia, Gabon, several of the African countries and a handful of uh, countries in uh, Asia and, and the Pacific that have historical very low deforestation rates and are not on the table for this red concept which looks only at those countries that have had high deforestation rates in the past. And these countries account for at least a third of all the remaining tropical forests and they must be included in efforts to really come to grips with this forest carbon issue. And we're trying again to develop some models on this uh, particularly in this region of uh, northeastern South America that I showed you earlier in the countries of Guyana and Suriname. These have the highest percent remaining forest cover of any countries on the planet. Guyana with 85 percent intact forest, Suriname with more than 90 percent. Really amazing how little deforestation has taken place there. In the country of Guyana, we've worked with the president, uh, Barat Jagdeo on the right, uh, talking to Harrison Ford, who's taken a personal interest in this uh, climate change issue. And the president of Guyana has made an offer to the world of the forest estate of his country to keep that intact, prevent further emissions if he is compensated at a level that is significant. And in Suriname, we're trying to float a huge bond offering so that we get international investors to invest on the order of $200 million in this country to compensate them for keeping their forests intact and develop a green economy. And this is something that's really in very early stages. Um, my wife and I are leaving for Suriname tomorrow to discuss this with the government there and to see whether or not we can develop this as a model over the next few months as we move up to this all-important Copenhagen meeting of the Climate Convention. So finally, we have uh, an opportunity to develop, to demonstrate value of these tropical forests at a level that is competitive with the other major extractive industries like mining and forestry and so on that have really resulted in the destruction of so much of the world's uh, tropical forest systems. And we also amazingly have an opportunity to redress at least in, in some small way some of the economic imbalances that exist in today's world because some of the countries with the most important remaining rainforest areas also happen to be among the poorest. We've touched on these issues uh, in some detail in another book that we've done, the most recent book called A Climate for Life. And I believe that's available in the, in the bookstore. And as we look over the next eight months, if there's one single thing we do that as, as a conservation community that takes precedence over everything else, it's to make sure that we get the right messages with US leadership, with leadership from Brazil, from China, from all of these really key countries in the world that natural forests have to be in the successor to Kyoto. And our one opportunity to make sure that happens is going to be this conference of the parties in Copenhagen coming up in the second week of December of this year. It is the, one of, going to be one of the historic landmarks if we can get it right. And so we're putting a lot of our attention into that now. Lastly, to finish up, I think I still have some of you with me. Uh, the fundamental importance of species conservation. We're talking about all these big issues, ecosystem services, human well-being, climate change, but we don't want to lose track of the fact that we still want to keep this planet an amazing 
highly diverse planet that is so unique in the entire solar system in the entire universe. And we cannot lose track of the importance of saving endangered species, critically endangered and endangered species. It's a moral obligation. These species are also very useful in selling the importance of entire ecosystems as so-called flagship species. And it also attracts a lot of attention with the media. The new species discovery is something exciting. It's uh, basic to the biological sciences. And I think it helps us in getting our message across. Well, a good part of my career has been dedicated to using primates as flagship species in many different ways. We've developed action plans for primate conservation over the past uh, 20 plus years. These have been pretty effective in bringing in the resources needed for primate conservation activities. And I should mention we have one of the world's leaders of primatology here with us in the audience, Richard Wrangham, who is one of the world's authorities on great apes and has very much been involved in great ape conservation over the past probably 30 years now. Okay. It's frightening. <laughs> um, we also have used uh, primates as um, a way to get attention in the media. Every uh, two years, uh, the IUCN primate specialist group, CI, and the International Primatological Society join forces to come up with the top 25 most endangered primates list. This attracts a lot of uh, media attention and helps us get the word out. And also, I've come up with this idea of stimulating the development of primate ecotourism. And this is based in large part on the inspiration that I got from Roger Torrey Peterson and what he was able to do with the first ever field guides that he launched in the 1930s. These field guides spawned generations of field guides on birds all around the world. There are now field guides coming out on reptiles, amphibians, insects, specific guides to primates, many, many, many field guides. And this has resulted in multi-billion dollar industries of people who want to go out and look at these animals in the wild. And this also was inspired by my oldest son, uh, John, who's here in the audience with us, who starting at about age 10 became a hardcore bird watcher. And what really made this click in my mind uh, was when he started um, as, an under, as a freshman at Exeter. He went out in the first week and he found this fairly boring bird from the southeastern U.S. What was the name of it, John? It was a purple gallinule. It's a common bird in the south, but it was only the fourth record ever from uh, the state of New Hampshire. And he put that out on this website. And within a few days, he had hundreds of people coming in to see this one bird. I thought, my god, this is really power. Now, why can't we do the same thing with primates and other groups of organisms? So I came up with this concept of primate watching, primate life listing. <laughs> And people love to list, and people are very competitive. And so what I'm going to do is uh, fairly uh, soon create a website that will enable people to put together their own primate lists. And the idea with this, of course, is to stimulate people to go to remote places where you can see these primates, and in so doing, contribute to the economic well-being of the human communities that live in these areas and show them that these animals are important for many different reasons. We've uh, tried to stimulate this through a series of tropical field guides, the majority of which so far have focused on primates. <coughs> and also, even more recently, we've come up with um, a series of pocket guides uh, for primates and for some other groups that are very easy to produce, very easy to use, and they have little checklists in the back so you can start your own personal primate life list. And I really think this can have an impact, and it's all been inspired by something that Roger Torrey Peterson was the true pioneer in going back more than uh, 80 years now. We've also been successful in raising funds for primates and for species issues in general. We um, have a foundation called the Margot Marsh Biodiversity Foundation that's put about $7 million in primate projects over the past um, decade. And just recently, we've seen a resurgence of interest in uh, supporting species conservation issues from unexpected places, one of them being the government of Abu Dhabi, which uh, has just created a 25 million euro species conservation fund focused specifically on small to medium-sized projects on species conservation. And the Global Environment Facility at the World Bank has also come up with the idea of a Save Your Logo species fund, which is starting off with $10 million and going to corporations who have animals as logos to try to get them to contribute as well. <laughs> so interesting idea. Let's see if it works.
the, uh, the first one already has its capital. The World Bank one is still kind of working on it. But I think it's, it's good that many key people involved in this are not losing track of the importance of species conservation as well. And the last thing that we're planning on doing, inspired by the great success of the World Parks Congresses, which take place once every 10 years, is we've now gotten uh, a resolution passed through the IUCN Conservation Congress to have a World Species Congress that we would like to put together sometime in the next three or four years to focus attention on the full range of important values that species of many different kinds provide to global society. So with that, I'm going to end again with an emphasis on the need to be optimistic and really look at all of this with a can-do attitude and not get frustrated by the challenges and the threats and the setbacks. They're always going to be there, but we just need to forge ahead, use the experience that we have to do something of truly lasting value for this planet. But as always, we have only a brief window in which to act. The next five to 10 years are going to be critically important. And all of you can play a major role in helping to make this possible. So again, thank you for coming. And thank you again for the wonderful award that I've received today.